back to my channel. It's Destroyed Deception. JK is here with another video. Today's video, we will continue part three discussing uh, the Jewish Catholic Daniel Suazo uh, reacted to his interview with the Corridor Catholic Albert Little. Um, go back and look at part one and two. Uh, great parts to understand where we are at this point if you haven't. Uh, but without further ado, let's get right into it. Said, okay, then let's go back to see how the earliest believers in Yeshua, Jesus, lived. And then I noticed something that scared me. First, I started looking at the Didache, uh, or Didache, however many people pronounce it differently. <laughs> uh, and I saw... Remember, he stated that he had to go back to the early fathers uh, of what they believed. It's important to understand that the writings and teachings that he's referring to, Daniel Suazo is referring to, uh, and about were not the writings of the New Testament apostles, but the writings of those supposedly after them, or the, those folks that would consider be disciples of the original apostles that are not found uh, as scriptures, right? Meaning there's books or writings out there that was written by these people that were supposed to be disciples of the apostles, but they wasn't found to be uh, good enough to be in the word of God. So, Direche or Direche or whatever uh, you see here, uh, he's referring to uh, the teachings of the apostles that passed down to the priests, um, prophets, and chief priests of that time to teach uh, three main topics, uh, which would be the Eucharist, uh, baptism, and the Lord's Prayer. This is like a summary of what is kind of like taught by uh, the Catholic folks. Now, those same writings and compared to scriptures, though, doesn't line up with the word of God. Like, and that's the reason why it wasn't in the word of God. The scriptures, any man, person, priest, judge, Levite, whoever. When they speak, write, do anything, have to line up with the word of God. And if it doesn't, then it's cast away. It shouldn't be heard and so forth. It's just like any teaching today. Um, if we hear a pastor or a teacher and you they're speaking something off the wall, similar to what we saw in part one, of if you hear, you know, they're talking about, prosperity and so forth is all you begin to cast them away like this really ain't lining up to what the word is saying you know or solo fide is a better one um this ain't really last lasting uh matching up to the word of god i gotta cast you away it's the same thing we would do that same thing with any p person or people writings of old without being that up let's go i mean i'm like wait a second hold on hold on <laughs> Why are they talking about this Eucharist thing as a sacrifice? Why are they talking about it as if it's really Yeshua's body and blood? Then I started looking into the Eucharist. Eucharist, also known as Holy Communion and, and the Lord's Supper, among other names, is a Christian rite that is considered a sacrament in most churches and as an ordinance in others. The same Eucharist was seen as the literal body and blood of Yeshua when consumed. Personally, I believe this is a twist of the scriptures. So there are a number of ways why this is a symbolic uh, and not a literal consumption of the body and blood. Number one, first, the Lord Yeshua said, do this in remembrance while he was yet alive and has not been sacrificed. Right. He was not sacrificed yet, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. There's no way that they can partake in a sacrifice that is not dead. There is no way that they could partake in drinking his blood without his blood actually being shed. Thus establishing that this is a symbol. If that, if that still doesn't do it for you, we know that Yeshua died for all people. Right. This will include that those that live before Yeshua since Adam. Right. Adam and Eve. No one before Yeshua could partake in the body and blood of Yeshua. 
So that justifies that it also has to be a symbol and can't be literal. Because if it's literal, then all of them need to take it as well. And then we know that they're not. All right, let's continue. I started looking into the apostolic fathers and i wanted to go early right so i wasn't just looking at the church fathers because in my mind i'm like ah, after the 300s after constantine everything got polluted and it became pagan <laughs> so that that was my issue with christianity that i mentioned before i thought christianity was just a pagan offshoot of what was but all right let's stop there real quick so here you see that daniel swazo confirms that the writing he used to counsel with was not of the bible but writings outside the Bible, which as a person seeking the truth, there's absolutely nothing wrong with considering any writings found outside of the Bible, which could be from any pastor teaching today, uh, just like back then. But when but we have to remember that there are important scriptures that are extremely fundamental when we read or listen to anybody. It has to agree with the word of God. Don't add or take away from the word of God. Again, nothing wrong with looking into outside writings. Again, similar to any pastor teacher of today. You, you should listen or read what you can to help validate what you believe is the truth. But your beliefs have to match up with the word of God. Similar to Christians. Can you map Christmas back to the word of God? No, you can't. So you could try to saying that, oh, the baby in the manger, so forth, but you can't map Christmas back to the word of God. It's, it ain't in there. So you can't create your own branch, which is not of God and put his name on it. He also addresses the pagan offshoot, the pagan offshoot of what was and is 95 percent contributed to the Catholic Church due to prayer offerings. And why? Uh, it's 95% contributed to the Catholic Church of why uh, things are considered pagan offshoots. It's because of the many prayer offerings, many praying at statues or edits with a statue um, or prayers given to apostles or prayers given to Mary or other saints. Uh, also, Christmas, Easter and 5% to the and the other 5% to other churches due to Christmas and Easter. To do these things are why they are considered pagans offshoots. Let's continue. But then the more I looked into the apostolic fathers, I'm talking about uh, people like Polycarp, Papias, or whatever is left over of Papias's work, uh, Ignatius of Antioch. I saw that they were talking very Catholic. And that is what really started changing my whole mindset of thinking, wait a second, I began my roots in Catholicism, dissing Catholicism, trying to debunk Catholicism. And as I kept going, that was my mission, because when I noticed it, I'm like, no, 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 there's no way I have to debunk the church. There's no way. And here I am about to be Catholic officially. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Will Remember, the writers, he began to trust in were writers that are not found in the word of God and doesn't line up with the word of God. Remember, in summary, for sake of time, not having to pull out scriptures at this moment, we see God did not include any of these writings of these early writers that were after the apostle with the writings of the apostles. What was your view of, mentioned trying to, de to debunk it, what was your view of Catholicism as you began to uh, explore the early church? Like, did you have a, I know for me, uh, kind of, you know, because I, I was saved at the age of 15 or so, attended a Pentecostal church, uh, into non-denominational churches, but in, in the early days of those Pentecostal churches, for me, the air we breathed was anti-Catholic. It wasn't like, it wasn't overt, it wasn't like expressed from the pulpit, but you know, Catholics were the Pharisees in many illustrations. Mm. That was just kind of understood in, in the the oxygen we breathe, and less so as I as I got older. And the churches that I was part of, my wife and I later on, and as we were married before we became Catholic, weren't anti-Catholic in that that same sense. But there is a lot of, especially I think in Pentecostal Christianity, that kind of anti-Catholic. Uh, sometimes quite overt as well. So, what was your kind of understanding of Catholicism when you began 
to encounter it in, in the early church fathers say? Well, it was very different from what I knew Catholicism to be before. So again, in my early years, I was very anti-Catholic. Even on the channel that I have, the Jewish Catholic, it used to be called Messianic Me TV. (laughs) At that time, if you actually go to my old videos, you'll see that that's the old name. In those days, I made videos talking about, God forgive me, negatively about the rosary, about the Pope. (laughs) And I thought that Catholics were idol worshipers. You know, talk about ignorance. However, when I go to the church fathers, these are the things that stood out. I haven't watched any of those early videos of Daniel Suazo's, but it would be interesting to see a reaction video from him um, uh, on him reviewing his own video and breaking it down to either show how he was wrong originally by the word of God to become Catholic and or to see if he will have to uh, to force his way in believing uh, in what he currently believes outside of the word of God, meaning we have to force his way to believe uh, in in uh, the current Catholic faith that he has today. It'd be very interesting to, to see uh, a reaction video on those earlier videos. I just want to point it out. Anyway, let's continue. To the church fathers, these are the things that stood out to me. Number one, the emphasis on the Eucharist. That was the main and first thing that kind of made me be quiet and listen to what they had to say. Because I was going in full force. I got to debunk this because it can't be that the earliest believers were Catholic. So in the beginning, it was that. It was the Eucharist. Two things. Number one, that it was really Yeshua, his body and blood. Um, And that it was seen as an actual sacrifice. The reason why this was so major to me, it's because if it's really God then nothing else matters. Like, who cares about any debates that you would want to have about anything? It's God, and you get to partake of that. And then, of course, being that it was a sacrifice, it really triggered my Jewish side to think, wait a second, this also answers a major question for the Jewish people. Because as I began to study, uh, I saw that Catholicism flowed perfectly from Temple Judaism. Because my major questions in the beginning were, okay, the, I'm, I'm looking at the history. The temple is gone. The sacrificial system is gone. The priesthood is gone. How do we deal with it? And I saw this. All right, real quick. So we need to unpack some stuff first. As you already know, the Eucharist is what is called, also called the sacrament. He is saying one of the reasons why he believes in the Catholic way is because of the supposed connection of the Eucharist to the temple sacrifice. Notice that he stated the Catholic way answers questions that many Jews have in regards to the temple. I want to point out two things. First one is that I'm not really sure is if there is really questions the Jews have regarding what to do since the temple is not there. They still have priests. Now, the priests may not be active uh, and so forth, but they still have priests. They understand that the temple is not there. So they can't do anything until a temple is rebuilt. Similar to when the temple was destroyed, when Babylon came through, they had to cease uh, service in regards to the temple because there's no temple. They had to cease those temple duties until the temple was rebuilt. Many Jewish people that I talk to have this understanding. Then the known priest will be, uh, but once a temple is rebuilt, then the known priest will be able to restart their duties at the temple. Second point, the temple wasn't destroyed until 70 AD. So the apostles are found not being consistent with what the early Catholic Church fathers believe and wrote about, right? And pay attention how I said it. Uh, I said the early Catholic Church fathers, not the apostles, because they are not a part of the early Catholic Church fathers, right? 
the apostles are inconsistent and not found being consistent with the early Catholic Church fathers. Right. Meaning Peter had the keys. He would have immediately known as well as all the apostles that the temple was no longer needed even when it was built. But we see the constantly them, them constantly at the temple and going to the temple during prayer hours as their custom were to do. We see Paul, Paul himself, we know as an apostle, having a vow on his head, made it a point to multiple times in Acts uh, 18, Acts 20, and finally in Acts 21. To point out that he needed to go to to Jerusalem because of this vow, and that there, and that as where he spoke with James in Acts chapter twenty one about keeping the laws of God, we see that Paul went into the temple to keep his requirements needed for when he uh, you have a vow. That same vow uh, and the requirements of the vow vow is found in Numbers chapter six. The sin offering and the burnt offering were the atonement for him. He would have to partake in those things and did partake in it. Uh, and, uh, and also the brothers that were with him, he paid for their service to be done as well. Now, these were these were a part of the vow requirements that makes him holy before the Lord God. Now, out of all people, we know Paul. He don't play that. We know that now of all people, Paul would have known that he would have known that and would have been strong enough to tell James that he, Paul, and uh, as all are not required to do any of this temple stuff anymore. But just like Daniel Suazo said from part one of my reaction video from early in the interview, he stated that the he saw that the requirements that the apostles kept continuing to keep the commandments of God. We see the early apostle doing that. Therefore, if they were doing it, then the early writers who were supposedly, supposedly to be disciples of the apostles are already contradicting what the apostles was doing and teaching. For the apostles, they all were keeping the commandments and the temple requirements. All right, let's continue. Solutions that the rabbis put forth and it just didn't satisfy me because it looked like if it was protestantism yeah. it's everybody making their own rules however all right real quick that is the thing as you guys would agree we all should be on one accord and how we all come to an agreement to be on one accord is through god's word not by adding or taking away from god's word Let's continue. When I went to Catholicism, I see that Yeshua, the king of Israel, establishes the high court, which is the Beit Din Hagadol that we were just talking about, reestablishes that smicha, the apostolic succession, brings the solution for the matter of the lacking sacrifice, brings a solution for the temple and a solution for the priesthood through himself, and through the bishops that uh, are established by him. So I get real quick. Again, we have to point out the major flaw. Again, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So the apostles are found not being consistent again with the early church, Catholic church fathers and what they wrote. Meaning Peter had the keys and the successor, the high court and the bishops uh, that were talked about would have all been on the same page with the Eucharist, the sacrament of the, of, the, of, of the bread and the wine. But we don't see that to be the case when the temple was built. They communicated none of these things that the Catholic Church fathers wrote about or taught. Again, they all would have immediately known as well as the uh, all the apostles that the temple was no longer needed even when it was built. But we see the constantly them constantly at the temples and so forth, and Paul having a vow on his head uh, and uh, all that he have done uh, as well. Uh, not to reiterate that again or to beat that up, but just wanted to uh, point that out again as we continue. 
this is the, the main thing that I saw in my early time studying Catholicism that changed everything for me was the fact that it seemed so biblically or what I would call Temple Judaism. It looked just like Temple Judaism, the fulfilled version. Yeah, that, that's so fascinating. And I think I, of course, right, we're... we're this too, I mean, <laughs> when I was looking into like the Messianic Jewish movement, just uh, as from the, the Christian, the Christian side, as a Christian, wanted to get involved in building those bridges with right. with our, you know, with with the, with the Jewish brothers and sisters who didn't know who didn't know Jesus. I had a hard time trying to figure out how, you know, it, it just seems like such a split. Like there, there was very little in in Judaism that looked like Protestant Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. And I totally see what you mean when you suddenly see Catholicism as this outgrowth of all those things. Like you're listing thing after thing after thing that the, the that existed in Judaism that kind of continues in in very similar terms in Catholicism. For us as Protestants, those things were just totally off the table. Like we didn't even hear about yeah. the succession or the idea of sacrifice or the idea of you know all of these things were totally. <laughs> foreign to us and it didn't make a lot of sense like if you i know this is hindsight now right but it doesn't make a lot of sense that because jesus he's quite clear he didn't come to abolish all these things but to fulfill them right exactly Our, our lord our lord tells us i'm not destroying all this guys but but the protestant christianity that we inherited it had no real tangible connection to those things anymore, so it kind of looked destroyed, right? I love that's that's a, a wonderful insight, and yeah, amen. Yeah, I mean that, that's it's all right. Real quick, man. So we see that the the Cordell Catholic admitting that what Daniel Swazo message regarding secession and connection between temple sacrifices versus the Eucharist, the sacrament, was extremely foreign. And they never knew that that or any of that. He admits there seemed to be a disconnect, but he is amazed of the connection all of a sudden, right? And notice that the use of Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 to say that Yeshua didn't come to abolish anything, just to fulfill. And he added that he believes that the tangible things are done. Again, if the tangible things were done, then they, they would have been done away with before the temple was destroyed. I hope you caught it. If the tangible things were done, then they would have been done away before the temple was destroyed. But none of the apostles believe or taught what current Catholics teach or the Catholic Church fathers teach. And if we're all honest, I promise you, 97% of all Catholics believe they are not connected to any traditions of the Jewish people. I promise you, 97% of all of them, even priests themselves, Chief priests themselves that gave give themselves title within the Catholic uh, organization believe that I'm sh- I'm telling you uh, they don't believe that they're connected to uh, the Jewish people. If we all are honest, but but that's besides the fact. That's not to say anything. But the facts are that the Bible is consistent and is. It is on one accord with the law and the prophets, and there's not anything new. Let's continue. So crazy because it this answers so many questions, and I think right now the question of how uh, Jewish people relate to the church. I think this is actually a, an important question that we need to be dealing with also, uh, and perhaps this is another conversation that we could have at a later point. Um, but I think. It all happened for a reason. This whole surge of Messianic Judaism, I think it was... After saving with customized car insurance from Liberty Mutual, I customized everything. Like Marco's backpack. Allowed by God to be an avenue to lead to Catholicism. Because as I mentioned before, if people hear my story, they might think, well, this guy's just jumping from thing to thing. (laughs) right?" He begins as a Protestant, then he's a Messianic Jew, and then he's wanting to embrace Orthodox Judaism. Now he's a Catholic. Forget it. The guy's going to be a Muslim next week. 
<laughs> I understand why that would seem that way, but if if you look carefully, I see the powerful hand of God in my life in that everything led to Catholicism. It wasn't going this way and that way. It was eliminating things that would eventually lead me to Catholicism. And I think a major rule in that, a major part of that was Messianic Judaism, because it led me to see the importance of not just believing, but actually living the faith. Then that led me into understanding that there was a need for an an interpretive authority, an authority that would be able to judge, decree, interpret, and guide the people. And all of these things only made sense in Catholicism. Of course, uh, before I got to Catholicism, there was also the question of Orthodox Christianity, right? Where it's very similar. There is a form of authority. There's apostolic succession. There is the sacrifice of Yeshua. There's all of these things, but again, going back to Judaism, I'm talking about Temple Judaism, there was also the role of the steward. And I think this is becoming a little bit more common and understood in the Catholic field, where more people are looking at the work of people like Dr. Brant Petrie. Uh, they're looking at the work that's done by a friend of mine, uh, Swan Sona, who uh, I think he goes by the intel no, the conservative intellectual. Intellectual um, conservatism is his There we go, favorite. yes. Fantastic. Good friend, Swan Sona. Yeah, and in, he's also one of these guys that has been really looking into the past and understanding the connection between ancient Judaism and Catholicism. So how I answered the question for myself between Orthodox Christianity and Catholicism was when I look back and I see the role of what is known as the steward, which is basically the right hand man in the kingdom, the one who is given the keys of the kingdom, uh, who is given not just uh, a governmental authority, but is also given priestly authority. And I mean, just listening by that, you already know that leads to the papacy, which is lacking in Orthodox Christianity. So again, here I am because of those roots where I'm looking at my, through the Jewish lens, it got me to where I am. So it wasn't really like God let me go crazy. It was God <laughs> refining my path until I get home. No, it seems like it. And I love that you. All right, guys, as this begins to come to a close, I uh, still got a little bit of ways to go, but as it begins to uh, wind down, there's one more a couple more things I want to address, which I already addressed a major part of the successor uh, from before in regards to Peter and to the popes that followed. But Daniel Suazo mentioned that the pre succession was missing in Orthodox, uh, missing in Orthodox Christianity uh, and the Jewish community, right? Which sounded like it may have sealed the deal for him. I want to point out that Peter and anybody outside of Aaron uh, and his sons cannot be priests while on earth. Don't add to the word or take away. And Yeshua can't be found going against God's commandments. Paul agrees with uh, this in, the, in his letters to the Hebrews. What, what I just stated. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 through 4. Verse 1 we see that Yeshua is the high priest in the heavens. His high priest duties cannot be given to another as he constantly intercedes on our behalf as high priest, never dying uh, again, similar to Melchizedek, right? Verse 2 through 4, which emphasizes with emphasis on verse 4, shows that, but on earth, Yeshua cannot be priest as God has set up sons of Aaron to be, to be the high priest on earth. Paul shows that the secession on earth has to continue as God commanded through Aaron and not anybody else. We now uh, we now uh, see this to be true based upon what happened to the tribe of Reuben and all uh, those who spoke against Aaron and the Levites, which is found in Numbers chapter 16, chapter 17 and chapter 18. Again, guys. No one outside of Aaron and his sons on earth can be priests. No one. Peter wasn't priest. Popes ain't, are not priests. Nobody are priests. 
to throw a lot, another uh, thing in there. Um, the Mormons do the same thing, right? They set up priests uh, within the Mormon churches or Mormon uh, organizations and so forth, right? They cannot be priests. It's only one required to be uh, one sons and so forth required to be priests, and that's the Levites. And then the high priests are of Aaron and his descendants are to be those pr high priests. And so we see not only what happened to Reuben, the tribe of Reuben, uh, we see also it happened again where one of the kings tried to go and uh, up to the altar and uh, do what was done to what the Levites, the high priest, supposed to do in regards to the temple. And um, what came up in his head? Some came up in his head. You Bible scholars, you guys know what I'm talking about. Establishing, continue to establish that nothing changed. It always will be. On earth, they are, it's what required. In the heavens, Yeshua is high priest. And the sons of Aaron cannot be high priest in the heavens. Anyway, let's continue. You even encounter, you know, in your in your foray into into Orthodox Judaism, you're you're still seeing this this very Protestant version of these things where it's it's different, say rabbis interpreting different things differently. And again, there's no there's no mediating force there. There's no council to refer to anymore. There's no this, this right. the, the temple you know, doesn't have that authority structure, even even in Judaism. So you have to keep looking for that that authority structure that that looks like what Temple Judaism used to look like, and, and here it is in, in the papacy. I find that so fascinating that that, and of course that I mean that should be. It's funny that it's not more important uh, to Protestants. I guess we just inherit this this faith, and and you know the, the the paradigm is the Bible alone, and our denomination or ourselves or in groups of people. You know, look at the yeah. scholars. The, the Bible is the backstop for for what we. No understanding with the faith and that's but where the idea comes from, right? We can just kind of inherit that. But if you come at that from from a, a Jewish historical perspective, of course you're going to be looking for this authority to interpret those laws right. because that's what always kind of existed. Right. And again, I go back to to being this, this It needs to be understood again that no one is above God's word, even the prophets. They all had to speak God's word or to be in alignment with it. He asked, where did it come from? Dependence only on the Bible. It comes from the scriptures. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. I know you guys tired of me saying it. And it flows into Deuteronomy chapter 13. Don't add. And if a prophet say anything other than what God has said and so forth, you are not to listen to them. If anybody is teaching anything different than what God has said and what God has told us to do, we are not to listen to them. We're not to follow them. We're not to do any of those things. We understood this. We understood this completely. Thus, Christ could not teach anything different from what was established. The prophets prophesied that Yeshua must come and our faith must be in him. That is it. All other beliefs are frauds and not of God. Let's continue. Again, I go back to to beating this this point over again. But why would God give us a lesser situation in the New Covenant than we had in the Old Covenant? Why make it harder to figure out how to be a Christian than it was to be a, a Jew in the in the Old Covenant? Right? Why make it more difficult? It's supposed to be less difficult in, in, in right. Christ, right? Right? That right? At least to become a Christian, not necessarily to live as a Christian, but to become a Christian, it, that 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 should be an easier covenant to access. Right? right. Exactly. It's also I wanted to address, but reiterate that uh, when he mentioned that God can't make a lesser thing uh, from uh, what He created from before, I wanted to remind you guys of the uh, first co the covenant compared to the second covenant. The first covenant was of life and death, of keeping God's commandments. It wasn't for a Sanhedrin or to create an authority. It, and that's, it's nowhere in there when he created the covenant. When he created the covenant, he didn't say uh, in that covenant there must be uh, an, an authority in a succession uh, of such. It wasn't in that covenant when he when 
Moses came down from the mountain and he gave the uh, commandments to the people from chapter 20 to chapter 24. You don't see anything like that. Right. And so the we see the covenant when he sprinkled the blood and so forth was of life and death. That's what it was for. The second covenant mirrored the first covenant of life uh, uh, in a sense of death, but establishing that he wanted to give more life and that more abundantly. And that if by Yeshua, you can do that. And if you don't follow this, now that he has his proper sacrifice, the death to come is more eternal. The second death that we all know about that is eternal. There's no coming back from uh, if you uh, are not found in right standings with the Lord. Regarding the authority, as I stated before, the authority was always of God, his spirit uh, uh, of God. And, and, and that's it. Again, Moses had the spirit. The Lord divided the spirit uh, to the 70 and so forth to help judge the people. But they all received uh, their counsel from God. It wasn't them interpreting anything by themselves. It was always against the word of God. What was already given to uh, how they should operate and what they should do. And if anything was too hard, there was to the counsel with God on those things to receive it. And that's it. Or compare it to what the word of God has already said. Let's continue. Because it now is universal. Um, and that's another question that got answered for me. So in Messianic Judaism, one of the struggles that people had to deal with is, okay, if we believe that we need to live according to the commandments, we need to realize that there's a lot of commandments that we cannot keep. For example, there are three feasts that require you to go to Jerusalem right. to an, offer a sacrifice. And people would say, oh, but Jesus died for us and he covers the sacrifices. The problem is that there were more sacrifices than just paying for sin. The morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, the other sacrifices that were done just of gratitude, the ones that were done for oaths. So what do you do with all of that? So it made people say things such as, well, when the temple gets rebuilt, then we're going to do that again. And here I am. I'm like, okay, what if you're a believer in Yeshua, Jesus, and you live in the Amazon? How are you going to get all the way to Jerusalem? Let's be realistic. Is God that messed up that he's going to say, yeah. well, sorry, poor person that can't afford to fly to Jerusalem three times a year. Then you're in trouble. We see that the Lord our God prophesied that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, descendants would be as the stars of heaven. Establishing that these people cannot be contained by land. There's absolutely no way that these descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can be contained in a land. Right? And they knew that many of their descendants would not uh, be able to stay confined to the promised land. That they would move about. Uh, to different places as when you see some of the scriptures or some of the scriptures talks about um, in all your dwellings and wherever you dwell at uh, and so forth, you are to do these things, knowing that they wasn't all going to be confined or have to stay in that land. More importantly, they were not all required to go to every feast. We see Samuel parents as a great example. They only went once a year to do sacrifices. So why is so if they only went once a year, clearly that say they went to one of the three that Daniel Swazo mentioned and so forth, where they missed two, where they was found in wrong standings. And why would the Lord listen to or bless um, Hannah when you you guys are now one accord, not being obedient to what? The Lord stated if that was true, knowing that that can't be true. They're not required to go every year. And the misunderstanding of the sacrifices that are used at the temple is misunderstood because the temple sacrifices are are uh, are offerings. It's everything is a offering. And so forth. Now, the Levites had a duty to do certain things every day to the service of the Lord and, and so forth. And that's completely different from 
requiring all the people that you have to do this every three times a, a year and so forth or however many times a year it was not required everyone knew that this was always offerings that you would do these things as offering and as the lord bless you give back to him for what he has blessed you to remember him to no, think about his goodness and things like that and so forth. That's what it was, it was for. Anyway, to give you another example, we see Paul missing also important feasts as well. When he was traveling throughout the churches, it was always understood that you would do your best to go if you could. But if you couldn't because you stayed or, or, or was living in the Amazon, it's understood that you wouldn't have to do, uh, wouldn't have to go. And the whole purpose that the Lord said, where he, when he said, go to, you are to come to Jerusalem and so forth, was only in regards to the sacrifices. He didn't want people sacrificing in the, in the Amazon or in the Americas, meaning out in, um, in your backyard, not that you have to be in a certain place. He didn't want you sacrificing in the backyard because what would happen uh, uh, from that is it would stem to become where people become evil. Then you start sacrificing to other gods and to other things. And now you're doing anything you want because you're doing, you're not coming to the place where my name is, where they know the standards of what is required and to do what is required properly. That's the purpose of why the Lord say, come to Jerusalem to do your sacrifices. No one should be sacrificing anything anywhere else outside of Jerusalem. So you're not required to come here. But when you do your sacrifices, you bring your sacrifices to the temple. Don't be sacrificing in your backyard or anywhere else or any other land and so forth. So think about it. When uh, the people of Israel, when half the tribe of Reuben, or half the tribe of Manasseh and Reuben was on the other side of the Jordan and they built up a replica of the temple. They wasn't sacrificing at the temple. At least they didn't supposed to if they did, but they didn't. And so forth. they built a, 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 a replica of it to show the people on the other side of the river. We also are part of Israel. Don't you cast us away um, to let y'all know just in case the future generations could rise up and try to cast us away. Say you're not a part of us. And so forth. It was to show that, hey, that same example is that, hey, all sacrifices should come to Jerusalem. No one should be doing anything outside of that. And you're not required to come here every year. Just when you do sacrifice, you bring them to me to make sure everything stay holy and the people stay holy. I hope you guys understood. Uh, understood that. Let's continue. It didn't make sense. But in Catholicism, the question, again, was answered for me. And, and that's the thing. It's all these questions that I always had were so beautifully answered. I mean, the name Catholic answers it all because it's universal. It means that it's accessible, as you're saying. It should be easier to attain. So what happens? I hope my answer was even more beautiful. As my answer is the truth and not a lie. And based on the word of God and not anything outside of the word of God. Again, the purpose was for everyone to understand they shouldn't sacrifice in any other place but Jerusalem. If they could, couldn't make it. God is not messed up that he would punish people for where they lived. He understands and all, and all knowing and made it. Uh, uh, perfect uh, for all of us to be able to keep his commandments. A sin offering, burnt offerings, and all offerings are not mandated for salvation. King David didn't immediately go to the temple and offer a sacrifice uh, when he had his situation with uh, Bathsheba. He got on the floor and fasted for seven days. And after seven days, he didn't go to the temple tabernacle and offer an offering. He ate. And it was understood what the temple offerings were for. Anyway, let's continue. Just wanted to get you guys. I hope you guys see the truth in what I'm saying. I hope you guys see that in your understanding of the scriptures and, and how things were and, and how they are now. Or open your eyes up to what it is in the truth of the matter. But uh, let's continue. 
So what happens in the fulfilled version of Temple Judaism, it's not based on the land and it's not based on the temple in Jerusalem because now the scriptures tell us that our body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. It tells us that the Spirit of God dwells in those who are the children of God. So this is a big misconception amongst us Christian believers. We teach as if having God's spirit was something new. That was always the way of God. All those who walk in God's commandments and his ways were walking in the spirit of God. Anyway, let's keep going. Okay, fine. I'm the temple. God lives in me. But what about the sacrifice? And then comes back the Eucharist. Well, when I consume, and this is why, again, look at these things. If, if you don't take the history, I'm sorry, I'm getting so hyped. I because as I, th as I think about it, I'm like, wow, God is such a genius. <laughs> okay, I'm the temple. Fine, God lives in me. But what about the sacrifice that's supposed to happen in the temple? Well, when you consume the Eucharist, it cannot be a symbol. Because if God is really in me, then the sacrifice really needs to be real. So when you consume the sacrifice, which is Yeshua, which is the Eucharist, there you have it. You have the priest, you have the sacrifice, and you have the temple. All righty. This representation of the body being the temple of God is, a, is all spiritual. And it cannot be a natural or I should more so say mixed with the natural. Again, we are on the earth. We are natural. We're not heavenly spiritual being. Actual sacrifices has to be as God commanded and not anything different. Priests have to be of Aaron, descendants and not anything different. And there are identified descendants of Aaron that are ready to continue in the priestly duties once the temple is rebuilt. But please understand that while on earth, we can, should, will remember Yeshua's death and resurrection by taking bread and wine until he comes. And when the temple is rebuilt, the actual Passover sacrifice, as all communicated uh, sacrifices, will resume and be representation of what the Lord has done. Part one, you saw where. Clearly, we are to keep, continue to keep the commandments of God. Part two, you saw where Soto Scriptura uh, is valid. Everything we must live by the word of God. We can't add or take away from it. And part three, we establish and show that the early church fathers are invalid. Their scriptures, uh, their scriptures, their writings doesn't match up to uh, the word of God. They're flawed in many ways. They don't match what the early apostles states. And I show this constantly over and over and over. And I hope that many of you guys will see that. Um, if you're truly, truly yearning for the truth and want to, do, want to do what the Lord God has said, I know I have said things that should stir in your heart to be like, I have to look into this more. I have to look into this more. And all I ask is just you just look into it. You don't have to make a decision today. You don't have to make change your whole life. All right, I got to do something different, you know, right um, at this moment. Take your time. Figure it out. The Lord, if you're true to, your, to, to want to do right, the Lord, will. he got time for you and he'll get you there. Please believe. Hope you liked the video. Leave a comment below. Many comments. Share the video with whomever is, is in need. Pray, uh, pray that Swazo sees it. Uh, I like to hear from them, but uh, turn the notification bells on and subscribe right now. It's Destroyer of Deception. J.K. is here, and I'm out.